The position of the public treasury, as I said before, is secure. And the viability of the Bahamian dollar and the exchange regime remains robust. So we wanted to make sure these people were not being overlooked. And so we created this grant program, providing grants of up to $6,000 for them. We were offering definitely face-to-face -face for our entire elementary school because we have the capacity to hold our students in the classroom. Don Davis coming up here, the government's strategy to steer the country's economy, plus small businesses over in Grand Bahama getting back on their feet with some much needed help. And we'll tell you how private schools are preparing for the new academic year. All of these stories and more when the morning edition returns right after this break. your COVID-19 isolation tips. Protecting others while in quarantine or self-isolation. While in quarantine or self-isolation, use safety measures to protect yourself and community from spreading COVID-19. Being in quarantine or self-isolation can make you feel anxious or stressed. Ensure that you take care of your emotions. Physical distancing does not mean socially disconnected. Stay connected with family and friends digitally. Keep a daily routine. Exercise daily, get rest, eat healthy, engage in activities, avoid unhealthy behaviors, and seek information from credible sources. You are not alone. Contact our hotline at 819-7652 or any of the numbers that appear on your screen. Everyone, once again, I'm LaDawn Davis, the government taking measures to maintain a strong financial standing amidst the global pandemic. The increase in unemployment numbers and feeding the needy demanded millions of dollars. Now, according to the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Peter Turnquist, the expenditure for the first two months of the fiscal year were higher than anticipated. Turnquist, however, maintains that the country has healthy reserves and its dollar is still strong. During a communication to the House on Wednesday, Mr. Turnquist said the government is seeking external financing to cover budget shortfalls. It is a strategy that is working. Notwithstanding the fact that we are five months plus into the near full shutdown of our primary export sector, the international tourism market, our reserves remain at a fairly healthy $2.1 billion equal to 38 weeks of import cover and close to levels at the start of the pandemic. The position of the public treasury, as I said before, is secure. And the viability of the Bahamian dollar and the exchange regime remains robust. Meantime, following that presentation in the House, Acting Financial Secretary Marlon Johnson listed plans by the Ministry of Finance for a strong and robust reopening of the economy. The government is supporting the tourism readiness plan and ensuring that um, all of the things that the tourism sector would need is in place and ensuring that, again, monies are prioritized to ensure that that reopening is strong. The government has allocated $55 million and the SBDC has already put together a government-approved business plan. A, a significant portion of that money will be tied into new grants and new loans for, for small businesses as they also emerge and the economy opens up to ensure that they have the capital and they have the wherewithal to be able to be uh, plugged in to the opened economy um, with as much ease as possible. 
Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Hubert Menes, tabled several emergency powers COVID-19 orders in the House of Assembly yesterday. He also tabled the first reading of a bill for an act to amend the Economic Empowerment Act, commonly referred to as the Inner City Economic Zone. The tax-free area is now limited to Wolf Road in the south and Delancey Street in the north. However, the extension will include Back Black Village, Angliston, St. Barnabas, Montel Heights, and Ridgeland Park. These areas would now be um, tax-free zone, Mr. Speaker. I also want to, um, the boundary would also extend along East Hill Road, thus including the old post office, so that as the new court complex is designed and developed on that particular property, they would be able to take advantage of this tax-free advantage zone. And Mr. Speaker, um, this would follow also with um, inclusion of, of camp sectors of Camp Road, sector of Fox Hill, Gambia, and also sectors of Adelaide, um, the more depressed areas, so as to help decrease their tax burden, allow them to expand their home development, build houses, etc., all duty-free, and um, in case of business, pay no business licenses, etc. The Grand Bahama Port Authority is stepping up in a major way, providing financial assistance to a number of businesses in Freeport post-Hurricane Dorian. The RISE grant, which stands for Restoring Industry and Sustaining Employment, provides local businesses with up to $10,000. Senior Manager of Business Development at the port, Derek Newbold, says the implementation of the grant is designed to help businesses that suffered greatly from the storm. It was a partnership initiative between the Grand Bahama Port Authority Mercy Corp, and we had donor partners in the American Red Cross and Bacardi Limited. As of today, um, we would have awarded some 256 grants under that program, and the value for those grants totaled somewhere around $2.4 million. And so that was one way that we felt it was important for us to step in and support the small business community. The Grand Bahama Port Authority also introduced a small business recovery program geared towards supporting micro-businesses in the hopes of capturing as many businesses as possible that meet the RISE Grants criteria. It's what we call the mom and pop shops sometimes, where they may have not had a, a valid GBPA business license or even a government license, but they had a vendor's permit or a peddler's permit. And you may have had one person operating in the business, but it's their sole source of income. So we wanted to make sure these people were not being overlooked. And so we created this grant program, providing grants of up to $6,000 for them. It was a partnership initiative with the Bahamas Red Cross and the Small Business Development Center. And uh, as of today, we have actually awarded about 104 grants under that program at a value of almost half a million dollars. Meantime, health officials continue to monitor COVID-19 cases and the impact on the system. The latest figures are showing 64 new cases, with 55 of them over in Grand Bahama. New cases are showing up in several islands, including Crooked Island, Mayaguana, and Inagua. The island of New Providence continuing to lead the country in the number of COVID-19 cases, followed by Grand Bahama and Abaco. Health Minister the Honorable Renwood Wells says a comprehensive covert responsible plan is underway to alleviate the demand. Wells says volunteers have also been trained to conduct contact tracing. We can now report, Mr. Speaker, that we have 62 volunteers now working alongside 71 surveillance and other reassigned healthcare workers. In addition, Mr. Speaker, our testing strategy has also expanded with testing priorities clearly articulated to, min to minimize use of our scarce resources. All avenues for procurement of additional test kits and reagents are being explored. Staff at the National Reference Lab, with the help of newly, and I say newly, hired staff have worked arduously to eliminate the previously reported backlog, with sample turnaround times now back to 24 to 48 hours. 
Also, the Ministry of Education confirming a possible po positive COVID-19 case at the Columbus Primary School. The matter was reported immediately to the Ministry of Health, Bahamas Education Managerial Union, Bahamas Union of Teachers, and the Bahamas Public Services Union in writing. The Ministry of Education further advises that in collaboration with health officials, contact tracing will be conducted if necessary. The Department of Environmental Health will advise on how the cleaning and sanitization process will take place at that school and will give the all clear for staff to return to work. And still to come, more efforts underway to curb the spread of the current pandemic. That and more straight ahead. Dr. Pinder. During this global pandemic, we ask for you to be responsible. As we fight the COVID-19 virus together, we would like to encourage you to do the following. Wash your hands. Cover your mouth and nose with a flexed elbow or tissue when coughing and sneezing. Practice social distancing by staying six feet apart. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And if you must go out, wear a mask. We stay here for you. Please stay home for us. To those of you on the front line, we salute you as we continue this fight together. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with GD Media Solutions and this television station. watch or warning has been issued, it is extremely important to be prepared and know just what to do. Stay informed about the storm's path by listening to the radio or television for hurricane progress reports. Check emergency food and household supplies. Be sure you have extra batteries for flashlights and radios. Bring in outdoor items like lawn furniture and garden tools. Anchor objects that cannot be brought inside. Secure buildings by closing and boarding up windows. Remove outside antennas and satellite dishes. Turn refrigerators and freezers to the coldest settings, opening only when absolutely necessary and closing quickly. Purchase ice and store it in an ice chest. Keep drinking water in clean jugs and bottles. Clean your bathtub with bleach and fill it with water for washing and flushing, not for drinking, making sure to keep the bathroom door closed so that small children cannot access the filled tub. Do not go out to videotape or take photos of the storm. Take pictures from inside where it is safe and dry. There is no harm in being overly cautious where a hurricane is concerned. It is truly better to be safe than sorry. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas in conjunction with the National Emergency Management Agency. Influenza, or the flu as it is commonly called, is a viral illness that usually occurs between the months October to March. The virus is transmitted from person to person through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Symptoms include fever, cough, headache, runny nose, generalized body aches, and fatigue. There is no specific treatment for the flu, and the symptoms usually dissipate after three to seven days. Because it is caused by a virus, antibiotics are not used to treat the flu. Persons are encouraged to rest and drink lots of fluids. Panadol is recommended for fever and body aches associated with the flu. However, aspirin should be avoided due to the risk of bleeding. To decrease the spread of flu, persons are encouraged to get their flu shot annually and practice good cough hygiene. Additional information can be provided by your community clinic or the Health Education Division at the Ministry of Health. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Public Hospitals Authority. Welcome back. COVID-19 ambassadors are now out and about in our community doing their part to help members of the public reduce the spread of the virus. Some of them are at local beaches and other key areas. Lloyd Allen is standing by with a team on Goodman's Bay. Under the uh, COVID-19 enforcement unit, uh, COVID ambassadors were launched just yesterday. And this morning, we're on Goodman Space speaking with a number of them. And uh, leading this charge is Chief Superintendent Shivago Dames from that enforcement unit. Good morning, Officer Dames. And talk to us about the launch that just happened yesterday. Good morning. After 
much anticipation and much preparation, the COVID ambassadors completed two days of intense training at the police training college. The COVID ambassadors will be responsible for ensuring that all those clients that are entering our country via the airport, that they are placed into the hubcat monitoring system, that those clients are monitored 24-7. They will also be responsible for ensuring that the public and business establishments are adhering to the enforcement powers orders. Now, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a, a relatively uh, a large space, 21 by 7. Uh, how many officers are we talking about, ambassadors? I'm sorry. We train some 66 ambassadors who actually complement 28 officers who were actually a part of the unit already. Those officers, the ambassadors, again, uh, will have responsibility to ensure that they are patrolling our beaches, ensuring that persons are adhering to the protocols, are wearing of the masks when they're leaving the beaches. Also, persons are social distancing. They will also be responsible for patrolling our cultural sites uh, to ensure that persons are, again, adhering to the protocols, wearing of the masks, and social distancing. Now, this morning, of course, we're speaking with uh, one of those ambassadors. He's a supervisor. We're speaking with Glenville Johnson. Good morning, uh, Mr. Johnson. And, uh, of course, uh, you've been on the job now for two days. This is day two. Uh, what stood out for you the most? Um, well, actually, first, talk to me a little bit about what is a COVID-19 ambassador? Well, um, a COVID ambassador, as the name infers, is um, someone that's going to be very diplomatic in our approach to enforcing the emergency orders. But we're also an enforcement unit, and therefore we also must ensure that the orders are adhered to from all aspects of it. And so from that aspect, we are going to sensitize the public with all the protocols, mass, social distancing, um, and also going to ensure that um, companies are also adhering to those orders with their um, hand sanitation, uh, markers on the floors, encouraging persons in their es establishment is social distancing and, what, and so forth. Now, as you spoke briefly, you said uh, uh, your unit or ambassadors rather also posted at the airport. Uh, those officers shouldn't take more than about five minutes uh, to get those persons logged onto the Hubcap app. Now, once they're logged onto the app, uh, what other information would you share with them uh, during their 14 day uh, quarantine? Yes, yeah, so um, immediately after the, uh, the information has been logged in, they are then um, told that there's an hour after they have completed that process to reach their self-quarantine. And um, immediately after that, then the monitoring aspect of it is turned on. And we have officers that will definitely um, monitor while they're in their 14-day um, quarantine. Now, you're obviously on the ground, and I asked you earlier, I'll ask you again, what stood out for you significantly, you, you know, even as a civilian? Uh, what are you seeing uh, that matters most uh, when it comes to enforcing uh, uh, these orders? Well, um, so my observation has been thus far that Bahamians are definitely starting to pay attention to the orders. Um, the unit is definitely around, out and about, that's going to um, sensitize the public to these orders. And so the push forward I've seen has been very positive. Prices are now taking heed, and the unit is also there to complement the executive orders and enforce those orders. And so that combination, I think, will lead to positive results going forward. All right, well, we're definitely looking forward to some more results uh, coming in from this uh, team of officers and uh, ambassadors. Reporting here from Goodman Bay for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS, Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Officials at the Atlantis Paradise Island Resort still evaluating their reopening timeline. A statement confirmed that an announcement regarding a specific date will be forthcoming, contingent upon protocols and guidelines for all open issues. While Atlantis officials say they are not going to comment on those open issues now, what they can say with confidence is that they are working through them. In other news this morning, come Monday, September 14th, close to 500 students enrolled in preschool will be entering the gates of Queen Kingsway Academy. It's one of several private educational institutions reopening for the first time this new academic year since the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's Carla Palmer. 
As a fresh coat of paint continues to dry on the outside of the school building at Kingsway Academy, on the inside, administrators and faculty are making the necessary preparations to receive all seven grades of kindergartners face-to-face -face on Monday. Elementary principal is Miss Gina Ferguson. We were offering definitely face-to-face -face for our entire elementary school because we have the capacity to hold our students in the classroom and our parents are very privileged for that. But we also offer persons who were a bit skeptical at this time of coming face-to-face. -face. We're allowing them to operate remotely at home. So parents now have a choice. You can do face-to-face -face or remote. Each child is going to have their own desk. So normally, you know, in kindergarten classes, it's usually a large desk that the kids work at, you know, for play and everything. And so now we have converted to smaller desks, their own personal desk space. And so on that, we're going to have persons on hand to assist the teacher to make sure that they're not um, touchy-touchy as they usually are. As for the high school students, 450 of them begin classes Monday, but utilizing the virtual platform initially before transitioning to a hybrid style of learning. The other grades from grade 1 to 12 will be virtual learning. Our teachers will be on campus. It is our plan to phase them in gradually. They'll be coming in, in some one week it'll be three times, one week it'll be two times. Principal Ferguson says over the summer break, they were very busy implementing the necessary health and safety protocols. We had the situation where we needed more Wi-Fi on campus. That is being rectified as we speak. Even with our nurses' quarters, we have enlarged that so that we can now have an isolation room if necessary, that students will be able to be held if there is a suspected COVID case. Um, we've also increased some space in our classrooms. We've turned four classes into three to make sure that we have adequate space to accommodate our students. Even in the elementary, we've provided now a larger staff room area for our teachers. We don't just want the students to be comfortable. We need our teachers to be comfortable in this new learning environment. Other improvements include these. Hand sanitization stations erected throughout the campus. But I am certain at this point we are very comfortable with the plans that we have set forward for our students. And we are confident that we will be able to work in this COVID environment. Kindergartners will get a peek at their school this Wednesday during a drive through process to collect their textbooks and meet their teachers from vehicles. A virtual video orientation is also scheduled for Thursday for the high school population. Carla Palmer, ZNS Network News. As the world seeks to move forward beyond the initial impact of COVID-19, schools in the Bahamas are also learning quickly that the method of operation must be transformed to accommodate both students and parents. Principal at Queen's College, Reverend Henry Knoll, says despite the challenges, the tradition of QC is standing strong. Here's Lloyd Allen. Force education around the world into a new technology era. But for schools like Queen's College, which has existed for the past 130 years, they say this transition has forced them to change the game. School principal Reverend Henry Knowles says challenging economic times have impacted overall student numbers. There is also the expected trepidation from parents. There were several families who have moved abroad uh, for different reasons. There are those who would have sent in word to say that um, due to financial difficulties or the life situations that they're in, um, that they will pull back. But we have not, we have been very blessed in that we have not seen the major decline that was predicted. To calm fears, the school has adopted a proactive approach leading up to the reopening of its Village Road campus this week. We had virtual school orientation um, where um, parents and students were able to hear from the various sections, departments and teachers on what to expect with school reopening and then there was an address from the principal as well, a kind of welcome back to school address. Then we had um, live um, training 
um, so that students and parents can also be trained in Google Classroom to be introduced to it. A transformed deferred payment option, along with additional counseling and resources, have been implemented to assist with adjusting to the new norm. The government of the Bahamas has said that it will look at um, supplementing its um, subvention to schools. We have not received official word yet if we were approved to receive the subvention. And so we are waiting, uh, eagerly waiting to receive some confirmation because it will help us to be able to help others move forward and give us this ability to support our teachers, our education, our um, resources that we need to put in and to be able to provide the quality of education that we're known for. Tomorrow, we hear from Zena Dean Hutchinson, QC's Academic Technology Coordinator, who has used the Google platform to generate an education management system to assist more than 1,500 students and dozens of teachers to explore a new education environment from the comfort of their homes. For the Morning Edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. And still to come, we'll take you into the forensic lab of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. That and more when the morning edition comes right back. This public service announcement was brought to you by the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture and this television station. Hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver, which is the organ responsible for filtering toxins from the body, producing bile for digestion and producing proteins and clotting factors. The most important cause of hepatitis worldwide is viruses, of which there are five main types. A, B, C, D, and E. Hepatitis B and C are major health challenges globally, affecting over 300 million persons worldwide. The suspicion of hepatitis may be a challenge as there are typically no symptoms. However, if infected, non-specific symptoms may include decreased appetite, nausea, vague abdominal discomfort, jaundice or yellow eyes, and abnormal liver function tests. If not treated, hepatitis of any type can lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer, which leads to over 1 million deaths worldwide. If you suspect you may have been exposed to the virus that causes hepatitis, talk to your doctor today and get tested. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Public Hospitals Authority in conjunction with the Medical Association of the Bahamas and the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. Here's your COVID health tip for today. To reduce your risk of COVID-19, it's important that you wear your face mask the right way. Your mask must cover both your nose and your mouth. Only covering your mouth is not enough because you can inhale respiratory droplets through your nose. If you and others around you are not wearing your mask properly, respiratory droplets from someone else can land in your nose, your mouth, and even your eyes. Or sometimes, someone's droplets can land on the surface that you touch. Then you touch your eyes and your nose, and then you can become infected. There should be no gaps in between your face and your mask. In addition to wearing face masks, avoid touching your face. Practice physical distancing, proper hand washing, and disinfecting frequently. 
touch. So, most important step, do your part to prevent the spread of This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health. Welcome back. Lloyd Allen and the Morning Edition team took to the streets early this morning and are standing by with your daily traffic commute. Well, good morning, LaDonna. Good morning, Bahamas. We're giving you your first look at traffic. This one coming in from the area of Robinson Road and Ethel, as well as Jenny Street. Already this morning, we've seen motorists traveling in both directions on this thoroughfare, traveling nice and smoothly, no major obstructions. And so, of course, if drivers have to traverse this area, they can traverse with caution and with care. This morning, we're also joined by Corporal Christopher Wimps from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division who's giving you an initial look at overnight traffic. Uh, good morning, Corporal Wilms. Uh, talk to us about uh, traffic matters overnight. Uh, good morning, Alan. Good morning, Bahamas. Over a 24 hours period, we had a total of 16 accidents. We had a regular 15 accidents, which is too much, uh, with just simple damages. But however, we had one with injury yesterday afternoon sometime around three o'clock. Uh, we just received information this morning, moments ago, in the area of Stock Street, uh, Nassau Village, uh, that a 61-year-old female was struck by a motor vehicle. Uh, after we completed this, we'll be able to further give you an update on her condition. Well, of course, that is an unfortunate situation. And this morning, we're also talking about avoiding incidents on the street. Uh, this is one of those. I spoke with officers just last week, and they talked about this being one of those areas for concern. Uh, talk to us about the challenge that uh, uh, officers uh, would have observed with drivers utilizing the turning lane here. Okay. Well, what you see here along the thoroughfare, we have tra vehicles traveling west. However, we have most vehicles that think that this road is overtake that you overtake on this road you cannot do that because the road has strict markings directing passengers uh directing drivers to turn either north along molly street or we have vehicles traveling east along uh robinson road where they can travel south off to any side corner uh we have people constantly overtaking and therefore causing little minor hits and bumps damages uh but at this time, we wish to advise the public that we will not stand for that. The Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division and the force entirely will not stand for that anymore. Uh, so every morning you will see police officers out here uh, conducting traffic duties to ensure that the public is safe, also that the road users are safe as well. Now, Corporal Worm says obviously a fixed penalty attached to uh, this infraction. Talk to us about what that penalty is and what drivers uh, may look forward to paying as a result of the, that infraction. Uh, that infraction is failing to keep left, uh, punishable by a $150 fine. So you heard it there. So, of course, uh, again, we're advising drivers, if you do have to use this area, it tends to get very busy. Uh, but, of course, there are a lot of uh, side corners that you can utilize as alternative routes. But if you do use the main road, remember that there are markings as well on the street to indicate when you should turn. And, and just finally, uh, briefly remind those drivers of those markings that exist. As you can see, the markings is a clearly a uh, hundred feet wide difference in terms of the length correction uh that could make a lot of passengers whether to turn north or turn south it has a strict market in the road that you have to pay attention to all right all right, so some great information coming in there this morning from Corporal Williams from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division. And again, this has been your first look at traffic from the era of Robinson Road for the morning edition. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Fisher, it's always a pleasure for you joining us live here on the morning edition to talk about your Women in Policing series. How's it been going? And, and talk to me about your experience in the forensic lab. Well, yesterday was an experience once again interviewing a special lady, a very smart, I must say, lady mm -hmm. on the Royal Bound Police Force. Chemist, science, oh, biology, you name it, she knows about it. I was able to go into the department of the police force where most persons don't know about, and this, this is the department where most of the crime solved it's not the guys on the street it's the guys behind the scenes that really really doing the way mm -hmm. and as we introduce you to this young lady this morning a lot of behemoths are going to be proud of what she is doing on her team and the education 
that she has. And then Rochelle Delavo is the first female director of the Scientific Support Services Section, formerly known as the Forensic Science Section. She has been on the force since July of 1994. I came home from university in 1993, um, having completed the Cato University. I had a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology with Chemistry, and at that time I felt as if I did not want to go into the education arena. I did not want to, I didn't have the finances either to go um, and into any other field, so I decided, okay, I need to get a job. What job can I get that's going to allow me to use my um, degree? And a family member mentioned to me that the police had a lab. Um, why don't I go up and take a tour and see what it's about? So I did that. I came and I took a tour. At the, that time, the director was James Carey. And um, I sat with him, and he basically introduced me to forensic science. And after the tour, I was like, OK, this looks like something I could do. This looks like something that's interesting. It changes. Um, I would also be challenged. So I decided to um, put my application in. I was recruited approximately a year later on July 1st. After graduation, she had to get her feet wet, so to speak, police work. I was transferred to the Southern Police Station, Market and Quaco Street. So during my stay there, I learned basic station duties. I was a computer terminal operator. And um, basically, I dealt with persons coming and making complaints, taking statements. Um, basic station duties and in September of 1995 I was transferred to the forensic science section. When she first got into the department it was a male dominated area. Maybe like 80% of the persons are female now so yeah the men we are outnumbering the men. I do not have any challenges um, I've worked with everybody here I think just maybe one or two persons have been here longer than I have so everybody came in and I've got to know them over the years so um, I know them and you know they should at this stage know me very well so they know what I stand for they know that I'm someone who believes in perfection doing the best job I'm somebody who believes in um, being professional so I was handed the reins and I feel as if um, I have to maintain the standard and even take it higher so um, I have no concerns I think that I was well prepared um, and, you know, I am honored to have been the first female selected to be director because since the inception of forensic science, they've only had male directors. So I'm honored to have been given the opportunity. And I have plans in place and I'm hoping, like I said, to move us forward. Looking at the time spent on the force, she feels she made the right decision. I must say forensic science lived up to my initial evaluation. Mind you, we may have the same types of offenses. We may have a rape, we may have unlawful sex, we may have a murder. But the scenarios are different. Every case is different. So that I enjoy the fact that every day I come to work, if there's a different case I have to deal with. And there's a different puzzle I have to solve. And for me, that works. Now, some people like just coming to work and doing the same thing over and over. But I think after a while, that would have been a bit boring. So, yeah, I enjoy it. And there is one thing Delavo is very thankful for. The government has provided us with training. I had the opportunity to go on numerous training courses abroad and um, I actually did my master's science um, through um, receiving a Chevalier scholarship from the British government in 1999 so um, being a part of this organization has allowed me to get a lot of training and um, that's one of the benefits of, of, of being a part of this organization. Now does she consider herself a police officer or a scientist? We are both because even though we're in the lab and we have to do forensic science work, we are called upon at times to go out there and actually work, whether it's national events like John Canoe, uh, general elections, and even right now because we're in the um, emergency orders period, we had to go out and work um, the curfews operations. And we have still have persons out there who are still working. So, you know, even though we're in the lab, we are police officers first. Lots of crime-solving forensic shows are on TV like CSI. Are you glued to that? <laughs> I tend not to watch CSI <laughs> simply because it gives an unrealistic um, view of what we do. That you could you know, put, in, put in a drop of blood in the machine and get results out in like five minutes. Um, it's more complicated than that. So I tend not to watch CSI, but I do watch Law & Order. <laughs> I want to see you smiling, but Don, <laughs> before I started doing these interviews with these ladies, I thought the police force was just 
the guys on the street, but getting to really do it, you get to see that the, the police force consists of many jobs. Like you see, there are mm. scientists, doctors, lawyers. So if, if anybody's looking to join the police force and you, you have a different career, I think that's the right path to go right now. You think we're ready for a female poli a police commissioner, you think? Um, you think? We're going to get to that soon because this female assistant commissioner is one that's right already out there. And we have an interview set up for her next week, so you'll be hearing from her. And hopefully in the future, we do have an assistant commissioner of, a commissioner of police who is a female. Continue those great stories, Fisher. Thanks a lot. The Industrial Tribunal recording a first in the justice system while also leading the way in the court reform. Vern Carey sat down with the president of the tribunal who provided more details on the initiative. The Industrial Tribunal is now the first smart court in the country, which means that all of its operations are digitized, online, and integrated, paving the way for easier access to justice and more efficient service in resolving trade disputes for legal advocates at the three courts here in New Providence and on Grand Bahama. Court President Indira Demerit Francis says the digitization of the Industrial Tribunal is the realization of a dream. We have the case management solution, which allows us to track cases from inception to disposal, final disposition. And then we have the e-filing portal, which allows counsel and attorney from outside to be able to access their files that they are parties to through our case management system and to upload documents from their offices. And we have the automated hearing transcription, which allows cases while being heard to be transcribed into documents. The push towards modernizing the operations of the Industrial Tribunal began back in 2015 when Demerit Francis was appointed court president. She says a three-year inventory of court files shortly afterwards revealed a number of outstanding issues that needed to be urgently addressed. Once completed, the move resulted in the efficient case management system now in play at the tribunal. Cases were being settled but were not being properly recorded within the institution so the matters looked as though they were always open. We had situations where the Section 60 uh, of the Industrial Relations Act, which allows the tribunal to encourage settlements, when, was not being used much as it should have been to cause disposition of files in a more timely manner. And then we had files where there were deceased persons where the files were never closed by, well, the deceased was the applicant, and so the file was never heard, and the file could not be closed. Had companies that no longer existed. Fern Geary, CNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Fern. And still to come, hear the story of a mother one year after giving birth during Hurricane Dorian. That story, straight ahead. It is important to take precautions to reduce your risk of getting infected with COVID-19, even when you go to the grocery store. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others while you wait in line to enter the store. One person per household needs to go. Use wipes to disinfect the cart or basket handle that you select. Avoid touching your face, unnecessary items, and surfaces. Try to touch only what you are buying. So carry a grocery list to help you move along quickly. Do not forget to wear a cloth mask while you do your shopping and carry hand sanitizer with you. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others as you shop. And at the cash register. as little time as possible in the store and get enough groceries to last you for a while. Once your groceries are packed and loaded, use hand sanitizer and rub your hands together until they are completely dry. When you come home from the grocery store, take off your shoes at the door and put all of your grocery bags in one area. Disinfect your grocery bags. Rinse produce and wipe down cans and packages with soap and water before you put them away. Wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds when you are done. Wash your clothes and your reusable grocery bags. This message has been brought to you 
by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. The Ministry of Health is working to ensure the safety of the Bahamian people. Help us minimize the risk that coronavirus poses to citizens, residents, and visitors by following these five easy steps. Step 1. Wet your hands with clean water, apply soap, and lather for 20 seconds by rubbing them together. Include the top of your hands between your fingers and under your fingernails. Rinse your hands under clean water, then dry them with a paper towel or air dry them. Remember to wash your hands before and after, eating, preparing a meal, changing a diaper, or caring for the sick, and always, after using the bathroom, touching money, shaking hands, or taking out the trash. Step 2. Cough and sneeze in your elbow or upper sleeve, not in your hands, not in the air. Or, you can cover your nose and mouth with a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Put your used tissue in the trash bin when you are finished. Remember to wash your hands with soap and clean water after you cough or sneeze. Also, remember never to spit on the ground, roads, or in open spaces. Step 3. Ensure that raw meat is properly handled and cooked thoroughly. Step 4. Avoid sharing drinking glasses, eating utensils like spoons and forks, or sharing personal items such as toothbrushes and towels. Germs can live on surfaces we touch, so wipe and disinfect surfaces where germs can live and keep your surroundings clean. Step 5. Avoid close contact with anyone showing symptoms of respiratory illness, such as coughing or sneezing. Should you or anyone you know feel that you have been exposed to the coronavirus, contact the surveillance unit of the Ministry of Health immediately. To reach us, call 502-4776, 502-4790, or 502-4737. We want Bahamians and those that live with and visit us to remain safe from the coronavirus. To do this, we need the help of each and every one of you to follow the simple steps we have shared. Let's stay safe, Bahamas. A mother who gave birth to a bouncing baby girl in a bathtub of an apartment complex during Hurricane Dorian is reliving her experience. Here's Romiko Knowles. You may not recognize it in passing, but this complex became the shelter for some 40-plus persons, inclusive of seven pregnant women during the passing of Hurricane Dorian. One of those women went into labor and gave birth in this apartment. We speak with the mother of little Kiana Neely, who celebrated her first birthday on September 3rd. Everybody was like, all right, name us Tommy. Just the name of Dorian. Kiana Neely, also known as Stormy, was born in unusual circumstances during Hurricane Dorian. And despite what was happening on the outside, this little angel was tired of being on the inside. The expectant mother, Monique Mackey, was in the hospital when Dorian made her assault on Grand Bahama. But the health care facility began taking on water, and Mackey, along with several other pregnant women in the ward, had to move. Health officials took them into an ambulance and attempted to move them into safety, but the ambulance stalled out on the road. We was coming out the ambulance, and I told the ambulance driver, Oh, Lord, I can't swim. What, what I can do? Right, so he said, don't worry about that, don't worry about that, we got you. So all us seven, uh, seven uh, uh, pregnant ladies, we make a train, and we um, was going in the church, and the church was in the water, and a couple of guys saw us, and they get this boat, and they put us in the boat, and they went to this lady named Miss Robinson. He came to me, and he said, Miss Robinson, he say, I have seven pregnant women in the ambulance and I need them to have some place there because they don't have any place. So I say, okay, so and then I look, I see everybody was coming up. All the pregnant mothers voice. They, they was in front. The pregnant women with the help of EMS personnel found a safe haven in Robinson's apartment. But out of the seven, one little infant decided that she couldn't wait and wanted to make her entry during the storm. As we go on in the house, well, I was sitting on until around but two o'clock that morning and I said, Hold on, my water my water break. So nurse Bodie, she said, Rush in the bathtub, rush in the bathtub. So I got in the bathtub. So I stood up and I like, I start pushing down. And then, and I, I said, y'all see the head? You see the head? So she's like, yeah. So I start pushing. So she say, well, 
give me this baby. You know, I pushed the baby right out. And there she was. Born in a bathtub amidst the worst natural disaster Bahamians have ever encountered, little Kiana was delivered safely. For many, the name Dorian represents a tragedy, but for Monique Mackey, it represents a time she received her greatest blessing. It was a blessing because, you know, um, most people lost their life, and I thank God mine was spared, and I ended up bringing a whole child into the world, and I was spared. You know, that's why I said that was a blessing for me, you know. As for Patricia Robinson, she says if she had to do it all again, she would. She says it was a delight. It feel good to know. You know. It really feel good. It feel good to know, you know, that God blessed this home with this little baby. And, you know, it feel good. I am so happy. I am so happy I did that because, you know, God, I don't know nobody. It's the story of strangers turned family, thanks to the experience that brought them all together. Ramiko Knowles, ZNS Network News. And it's time now to get in shape during your Thursday workout session with downtown Natasha Brown. The only reason we are alive today is because of God's grace and mercy. Welcome, this is downtown, and I've got a perfect outdoor workout for us. So find yourself the perfect spot where you can do suicides based on your own fitness level. If you're not able to run, you can walk it. Let's get right into it. to you. Hi, I'm Dr. Ferguson. During this global pandemic, we ask for you to be responsible. As we fight this COVID-19 virus together, we would like to encourage you to do the following. Wash your hands. Cover your mouth and nose with a flexed elbow or tissue when coughing and sneezing. Please practice social distancing by staying six feet apart. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you must go out, wear a mask. We stay here for you. Please stay home for us. To those who are on the front line, we salute you as we continue this fight together. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with GD Media Solutions and this television station. The Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st to November 30th. 
when a hurricane alert is issued for your area, which indicates the possibility that you could experience hurricane conditions within 60 hours, you should begin the initial stages of preparation for the storm. When the storm is 48 hours away, a hurricane watch is issued. Once a watch is issued, be sure to get updates from the Met Office via television or radio. Get your battery-powered radio ready. Keep your emergency supply kit, blankets and sleeping bags handy and keep children and pets indoors. Be sure you have extra cash and a car tank full of gas. Fill all prescriptions. A hurricane warning means that a storm with winds up to 74 miles per hour or more is 36 hours away. At this point, secure all windows with shutters and plywood. Place your valuables in a waterproof container and store them on the highest floor in your home or in the safest area. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas in conjunction with the National Emergency Management Agency. It's a part of all our lives. TV is where we go for information. Entertainment. And enjoyment. ZNS is there. With something for everyone. Kids, lunch is ready. ZNS TV, a part of our lives for 40 years. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. Continuing to make ZNS your number one news and information network, only the sun covers the Bahamas better than ZNS. And that's a wrap for us this Thursday morning for the entire team. I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great day, everyone. Well,